Pleasant Sabbath, everyone. Again, to all our online viewers, Pleasant Sabbath to you. Um, we are all dressed in pink and some flowers and all these things because we too are standing with um, the country as we support the cause to stand against violence for women. And sometimes we don't like to speak about these things, but it is also happening in our churches. So we are standing as a praise team, as a church, that this will stop. Not just for the world, but for the church as well. And so I think we should just bow our heads and for just for a minute, just pray silently for all that is going on right now. Father, you heard the prayers silently. Let thy will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Visions of glory. Visions of glory is our topic today. And how many of us are looking forward to when we see Jesus face to face? That will be glory for me. Will that be glory for you? That will be glory for you. I am looking forward to when we see Jesus face to face and we just sing and shout and say, Lord, thank you for redeeming me. So, hymn number 435, oh, that will be glory. Peace. 
How many of us are looking forward to when we see the king yeah. in his glory? In his glory, I shall see the king. And forever, in his praises, I will sing. Twas on Calvary, Jesus died for me. And I want to see my king someday. Hymn number 426. forward to the glory of the coming of the Lord. Anybody want to sing that song with us? Yeah. Now it's a little marching kind of something, right? So you had a, your body had to go with it, right? Because the truth is marching on.
Good morning. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you our lecturer for the ninth annual Harold Batiste Lectureship. Nicholas P. Miller is a professor of church history at the Seventh day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University, in Bering Springs, Michigan. Dr. Miller has degrees in theology, BA from Pacific Union College degree in law, JD, from Columbia University, and American Le Religious and Legal History, PhD, from the University of Notre Dame. He has taught courses on church history, religious liberty, and Adventist theology for about 10 years at the seminary. Prior to that, he was a lawyer in private practice, specializing in church and state cases. 
He has appeared before the United States Supreme Court and helped to draft federal legislation protecting religious freedom. Dr. Miller has published more than 30 scholarly and professional articles on topics of church history and religious liberty. He has authored several books, including The Religious Roots of the First Amendment, Oxford University Press 2012, The Reformation and the Remnant, Pacific Press 2016, and 500 Years of Protest and Liberty, Pacific Press 2017. He was also the main editor and a contributor to Homosexuality, Marriage, and the Church from Andrews University Press 2012, and is, a contrib and is contributing a chapter on the pastor, civil, and religious marriage to the forthcoming Biblical Research Institute books on the family and the sexuality. Dr. Miller enjoys surfing and scuba diving, mountain climbing, biking, and playing tennis and basketball with his students, as well as with his children, Patrick, 20, Kelly, 18, and Nicole, 10. He is married to Leanne, a singer, violinist, and a practicing pediatrician. Dr. Miller, it's good to have you with us at the University of the Southern Caribbean once again. Um, in the nine years of the Harold Batiste Lectureship Series, he's the first person, so he is making history today to be given a lecture for the second time because he was also a presenter back in 2018. So without anything added to that, I want to welcome Dr. Miller to the University of the Southern Caribbean once again. And I know that we will be thoroughly informed and impacted by his presentation, his lecture today. So Dr. Miller, it's all over to you now. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshall. Can you, uh, can you hear me all right? Can yes, we can. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, sir. Excellent. It's always good to double check those things so you're not just speaking into the void. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's good to see you, uh, Dr. Marshall. Uh, it's been a few years, and uh, I have to say that um, this is a wonderful gathering and occasion, and I'm deeply privileged to be a part of it uh, again but it's gonna be hard to beat my first visit when I was actually on the island. And uh, Dr. Marshall, Cyril and I, uh, he perhaps, uh, we um, are friends from Andrews University where he has studied and we spent a good afternoon. Uh, he put me through my paces climbing a mountain not far from the university and uh, it was a delightful time, and being on your island was a wonderful visit, with Dr. Foz and, and with others. Uh, but the times we live in are somewhat different than they were four years ago, and both the church and the world has faced a challenge of enormous consequence, and it is a challenge that is telling us many things about ourselves, um, things about our society, and things about the church. And I was so pleased uh, to have such a wide range of representatives this morning, bringing us greetings from various institutions, both in your country and um, uh, even, even from elsewhere, but certainly a um, uh, interdenominational gathering, if you will, and uh, perhaps if I'd known it was going to be so eclectic, I wouldn't have made such a narrow uh, title for my talk because indeed this crisis of identity stretches across the Christian communion uh, as we are all faced with this challenge. Obviously, I speak especially from within my own tradition, though my training in church history was was broader than that, looking largely at the, at the Protestant tradition. And I, and I studied at a Catholic university, the University of Notre Dame, had a wonderful time there. So I feel that the topic that I'm touching on today uh, cuts across denominational boundaries and that we can all learn lessons from each other. And I, and I feel that our experience within Adventism can speak to challenges that other denominations are facing. So um, if, you, if you think about the title, The Pandemic, Vaccination, and the Crisis of 
Adventist and conservative evangelical and Christian identity, it will come closer to capture what uh, I'm attempting to speak to. Um, now, I would like a clue. I, I have a program and I see the order of events, but there's no timing noted on the program. I mean, I'm just wondering about how long do I have to give my presentation, as I do want to leave time for discussion and question and answer. Uh, Dr. Foz, is there a... Yeah, I had sent that to you. It's 45 minutes. Okay, very good. I'm sure you did. And I've, <laughs> I'm actually speaking to you from the West Coast. I'm usually on East Coast time, and it's a bit earlier out here on the West Coast. So I've managed to gather myself, but it hasn't been for too long. So thank you for that. I think we can get through in, in 45 minutes. So let me, uh, let me dive in. Um, Certain elements of right-wing Adventism and the larger evangelical Christian world have reacted urgently and at times even defiantly to at least here, what here in the United States was a relatively benign federal government COVID rule that encouraged vaccination but allowed for masking and testing for those that object. Now, recently the Supreme Court knocked down that rule but the period of time when it was in effect was very instructive uh, because many conservative Adventists and, and Christians uh, had much to say about the intrusiveness and uh, the, the problems with that rule. But this same group seemed to have very little to say about the deaths of what is now nearly 900,000 of our fellow citizens in the United States and many millions more around the world. And it raised the question, why was there this disparity of concern? Um, why do we have so much to say about our individual conscience and much less to say about so many deaths and the vast suffering of so many of our fellow citizens? Why has the loss of probably, and I don't know the exact numbers, it could be a few hundred, maybe it's uh, some thousands of jobs by vaccine-resistant Adventists. And I'm not saying the loss of these jobs is always justified, but it's mostly been in the healthcare field where keeping vulnerable patients safe is honestly an ethical priority. Why has that been viewed as such a greater tragedy than the loss of so much life. I think this is a basic ethical question that should cause all Christian churches to reflect on where they stand uh, in, in their moral reflection as a community. Now, I don't want to say I don't see the other side of this. Adventists have always valued freedom of conscience. Um, it's high on our list of theological priorities, and it should be. That's what I've devoted my life to, uh, to understand the development of the protections of conscience in the West. But we've also valued promoting and protecting life and health. Uh, in the great pandemic of 1918, we did not view these, con these values as in conflict. I reviewed our church papers from the years surrounding 1918, and there was a record of churches closing for weeks and months at a time, of schools closing, uh, of people receiving vaccines. But not once did I read a word anywhere that these requirements and these closings and these vaccines were somehow a violation of religious freedom and freedom of conscience. We understood that these were health care matters that the government had and has a legitimate interest in. What has brought us to the point that a moral monomania for what amounts to economic freedoms or job security appears to overshadow, even eclipse concerns for the basic health and safety of so many of our friends and neighbors? What has happened to Adventist identity, to conservative evangelical identity in the last hundred years to allow this change to take place? And since I'm speaking with a academic gathering, a, a group of scholars, I, I will call it a college of scholars, and that the importance of that will become clear later in my talk. What has happened to our epistemological framework? 
that has caused different parts of the church to believe such radically different descriptions of reality. I think these questions of Adventist prophetic views, evangelical prophetic views and identity, and epistemology are very related, and understanding one will help us understand the other. As a place of scholarship and learning within the church, we need to understand more deeply the epistemological crisis that we face as a Christian community and how we can help the church move forward to a place of greater understanding and unity. At the outset, I want to be clear that I do not support general vaccine mandates. Uh, this is not because I do not believe the vaccines are basically safe and useful. I do believe, based on studies I have reviewed, as well as the opinions of health experts in positions of trust in the church and in the government, that COVID vaccines are both safe and effective. But I also believe that mandating them upon all workers or all members of society would be counterproductive because of the resistance it provokes, which is harmful to both individuals and society. For this and other reasons, I think such general mandates are unwise and unconstitutional, as the Supreme Court recently um, uh, ruled, um, though it did rule that vaccine requirements in the healthcare industry are a justified protection of vulnerable and at-risk patients. And I guess that would be my position as well, that I'm not in favor of general mandates on everyone in society, but people in certain jobs that are sensitive, where you're in contact uh, with those with compromised immune systems, that you do have an ethical obligation to protect yourself and them from further harm. So because of my general opposition to forced vaccinations, I was the main author of a model letter uh, that many uh, religious liberty departments, at least in the United States, use to give to members who are conscientiously opposed to the vaccine. Uh, where an employee can be kept safe in the workplace, they can work from home, they can work in places where they don't uh, contact the general public. We believe they should be accommodated in their health convictions but it is not a religious liberty matter of the church. Therefore, this model letter is not from the church or the pastor. It is from the member themselves on their own letterhead, though we will help them with the wording of it. Um, the church has no teaching against vaccines. On the contrary, it has released statements encouraging responsible vaccination among its members. Indeed, it has held neighborhood vaccine clinics at the North American Division headquarters in the United States. Whatever you think of their wisdom, vaccine programs are motivated by health safety reasons and are not designed to promote a religious view or ide ide ideology. While opposition to them is at times couched in rights of conscience or even religious freedom, the underlying objection almost always has to do with a mistrust of their safety or their efficacy or both. Thus, this is not at its core a religious disagreement. It is a scientific one over the impact of the vaccines. We believe that most opposition to COVID vaccines are not based on good scientific evidence, but on misinformation mixed in with various unreliable conspiracy theories framed in an Adventist prophetic outlook or an evangelical prophetic outlook. And these often involve suspicion of the government and health leaders and the belief that they are actively ignoring the deaths of citizens allegedly caused by vaccine um, side effects. Uh, and they are suppressing knowledge and information about natural remedies or other easily available remedies that could save lives and thus acting in a way either negligently or recklessly or even intentionally to bring about the deaths of large numbers of citizens. But this is not a new combination. And when I say a new combination, I mean anti-government conspiracy theories wrapped up in biblical prophetic outlooks that are um, shared with church members. And from firsthand experience, I know that this can be a dangerous and even lethal combination. Let me give you a little background 
many decades before COVID was a thing, I was a student in England at Newbold College in the mid-1980s. And there I developed a friendship with a number of students studying religions. At times, we bemoaned, bemoaned what we considered the progressive and even liberal ways of some of our professors. There seemed to be uh, an avoidance and even a skepticism towards traditional Adventist teachings, such as the sanctuary and, and our prophetic message. A vacuum developed on these topics that we filled with our own reading, research, and discussions. And some of these friends of mine were from the Caribbean region, right? They come from the Caribbean region to, to Newbold, and it's more conservative in the Caribbean. Northern Europe is more liberal, and there's a, a clash of cultures. The year after I left Newbold, however, this vacuum came to be filled with less benign influences. Some American visitors came to the neighborhood and began holding off-campus meetings, promoting anti-government and eventually anti-church conspiracy theories that were constructed within an Adventist prophetic framework. Some of my friends apparently found the prophetic focus they were looking for. On a trip back to the campus a year or so later, one of my friends urged me to join their movement that was led by a charismatic, smooth-talking leader adept at mixing history, prophecy, and current events. There was talk of traveling to Israel and being prepared to expose corrupt earthly governments and usher in the reign of the heavenly kingdom. I pushed back, pointing out that this scenario was not consistent with important aspects of our prophetic outlook. Uh, and that opposition to earthly authorities was called for by the church only when, it, when they threatened our religious beliefs and worship. And even then, it was to be a peaceful civil disobedience, that we believed in Christ's intervention into this world and that we were not to openly oppose earthly authorities, uh, except in matters of conscience with peaceful civil disobedience. But my friend was not to be dissuaded, and I had a sense that he had bought into the fervid ambitions of this charismatic leader whose vision of reality had overtaken my friend's critical thinking skills, and just as importantly, that he could no longer hear words of warning from within his own church community. He and several others followed this leader, not to Israel, but to their new heavenly earthly kingdom of Waco, Texas. And most of us know the tragic story of David Koresh in Waco and the fiery deaths that occurred in the final government assault on their compound. Perhaps they would argue that their suspicions of government abuse and corruption were right all along. But others of us would see the events there as a self-fulfilling prophecy. As Christ warned, they that take up the sword, especially against the state, may well die by the sword as the state responds to an internal threat. The logic of the outcome does not, however, lessen the sorrow for the death of my friends, of many others, at the Davidian compound. But more importantly, this experience compels me to speak up, as I believe that I see elements of history repeating itself. With new smooth talkers, both within and outside Adventism, leading a campaign of anti-government, anti-church, conspiracy rhetoric wrapped in Adventist prophetic language. These efforts, I believe, have already contributed to a climate productive of deadly results. Just in my own local Adventist community, there have been multiple deaths among vegetarian health message reforming Adventists who have not been vaccinated, um, a number of them members of a church in my community that has chosen to platform a message critical of COVID vaccines, critical of health leaders, and critical of the government. Now, some may balk at comparing the long-haired, fast-talking, rock music playing Koresh uh, with these other more recent anti-vaxxers who are well-educated with well-pressed suits, uh, medical and other degrees, but charisma takes many forms and anti-government conspiracy theories will lead to negative and baleful outcomes. The most important and most tragic comparison is the undeniable truth that the anti-COVID vaccine movement has contributed within the Adventist church, has contributed to the deaths of more Adventists than David Koresh hmm. ever did. Hmm. 
It is thus with great chagrin and concern that I watched recent meetings of Christians, including prominent Adventists, who oppose both vaccine requirements and honestly the vaccines themselves. Often these groups claim to promote health, conscience, and religious freedom, but it quickly becomes apparent that the religious liberty theme is a fig leaf to cover the core anti-COVID vax message and the government conspiracy theories that lie at the heart of the movement. Main speakers at the meetings uh, promoted by these groups repeatedly warned that the vaccine is not effective, but that it is also harmful, causing the deaths of tens of thousands of people. The claim is made that the government and media cover up these deaths and also suppress the effectiveness of alternate natural forms of prevention and treatment. In making these claims, they often rely on what's known as the VARS, the vaccine reporting system, data in a way that is demonstrably misguided and highly misleading, resulting in false conclusions about the impact of vaccines. In short, what they cite as causation is merely correlation. Adventist physicians and scientists have pointed this out, including uh, Dr. Sean Pittman, uh, who, you know, when you vaccinate, as he uh, uh, says, 100 million people, a certain number of them would have died even if they'd not been vaccinated from strokes, heart attacks, cancers, and so on. The question is whether the death rate for the vaccine recipients is higher than the death rate for the background population. And the simple answer is that it is not. Uh, Dr. Pittman's excellent analysis of the anti of the VAERS reporting system axi- uh, vaccine uh, fallacy is on his website, and other experts have made similar observations. And I'm going to drop links to this because I don't want to be accused of not dealing with any facts, though I don't want to get lost in the science. And so I'm putting links in the chat, which hopefully everyone can access uh, on their own time and check these things out. More recently, strong evidence has emerged that not only do vaccinated people not die more frequently than unvaccinated, but in fact, the opposite is true. Vaccinated people not only die less from COVID, but also from all other causes of death. Thus, claims that the vaccinated are dying from various non-COVID causes in higher numbers is simply not true. Another Adventist physician and researcher, Dr. Roger Schwelt, has examined a massive study demonstrating these truths and put a video, he puts up weekly videos on YouTube that I cannot more highly recommend um, and discusses this study. And it shows that the people who claim that those that are vaccinated are dying from lots of other causes and getting sick from other causes simply isn't supported by the data that is out there. And this is not a man who works for either the government or the pharmaceutical company. He's a private physician who's an adjunct professor at Loma Linda University and has only incentives to provide his fellow brothers and sisters in the church with an understanding that would promote their safety. Now, the studies that I've just shared with you relate to the, to the Delta era. We're well into the Omicron era. But studies continue to show that even with the Omicron variant, uh, which even the vaccinated are susceptible to, and we have to acknowledge this, the vaccines don't stop you from getting uh, uh, COVID, especially the Omicron variant, as much as they did the earlier variants. And so some people conclude that the vaccines aren't working. This is simply not true. You might get it, but you will be much less fearfully impacted by it. As my own wife and I discovered when we're both vaccinated, we came down and we spent our time in quarantine working from home with no real problems. We have a younger friend, uh, several years younger, who's just as healthy, if not healthier, but who chose not to be vaccinated and was in her bed with fever for days on end and had to go into the hospital. So it does make a difference. And studies continue to show that serious cases of COVID, those that require hospitalization and lead to death, are somewhere from eight to 12 times more likely to occur among the unvaccinated than the vaccinated. And again, I have a series of sites that I will put into the chat. 
and they are from um, the New York Times and uh, as, as well as um, Time Magazine and from the Atlantic Monthly. Now, the problem with this is that many people in the church or a quarter of them or maybe a third of them will say, ah, an article from the New York Times, from Time Magazine and from the Atlantic, I simply don't believe the data they report. Well, what do you do when liberal media sources are actually supported by testimony from your Adventist Christian neighbor physicians, uh, one of whom runs a hospital system? Consider this report. Dr. Lauren Hamill, friend, friend of mine in Southwest Michigan, president of the Spectrum Health Lakeland system in Michigan. And in January, he reported, and this is a quote, 86% of COVID admissions are friends and neighbors that have not been vaccinated. Right now, 100% of our ICU admissions at Lakeland are for individuals that are not vaccinated. The vaccines, he says, absolutely decreases your risk of hospitalization and dramatically decreases your risk for ICU admission, for ventilation, and for death if you've been vaccinated, close quote. Why don't some Adventists believe healthcare professionals associated with their own church, like Drs. Hamill, Schwelt, and Pittman, whose uh, materials I put into the chat, as well as other Adventist health leaders at Loma Linda, at the General Conference, at the North American Division. Recently, sermons have been preached suggesting that church leaders are strongly influenced by money from the government given to the Adventist health care system. This claim is simply untrue. Uh, the church recently reissued a statement affirming its support for vaccines that was supported by various departments within the church, including the Parle Department, the Health Department, the BRI, as well as the, uh, the, the General Conference Administrative Committee. I was involved in the Parle Department deliberations about what we should say. I can assure you that never at any time was the issue of money going to our hospital systems part of that discussion. Uh, if it had been raised, we would have rejected it. Uh, we would have found unacceptable any influence in our decision being money somehow in the medical system, which honestly doesn't impact uh, the, the church um, community and administration that I'm a part of. There's no evidence that concern for government funds was a factor at all in the church's approach to vaccines. In my view, the real reason that some Adventists view the claims of Adventist experts and leaders with suspicion is the same reason that my friends at Newbold would not listen to the warnings and cautions of their Adventist friends and leaders. They have been influenced by unhealthy, sensational conspiracy theories about the government and church leadership, a recent well-publicized meeting that included prominent Adventist figures had a main speaker who ended his presentation against the vaccines by arguing that the reason efficacious and good treatments were suppressed and dangerous vaccines promoted was because of an alliance between big pharma and government leaders, including the CDC and the WHO, Bill Gates, the Ford Foundation, and many other organizations, including presumably church leaders who go along with the mandate. The irony, of course, or one of the ironies, is that the anti-vaccine leaders accuse the media of using fear of COVID to manipulate the masses. But the anti-vax groups use the fear of almost everything else. All the institutions that help organize and protect our lives, including the government, healthcare institutions, church organizations and leaders, to convince its leaders, its listeners, that it alone can be trusted to provide guidance on important health and religious liberty questions. Rather than escaping fear, if you buy the arguments of the anti-vax conspiracy theory proponents, you will be plunged into a world of constant fear and distrust, one that I believe is deeply at odds with scriptural teaching about both church and state. If you read the, uh, Romans 13, Titus 3, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 5, 
we are told that the powers that be in the world and in the church are for our basic good. Yes, we are told that the state at times will exceed its God-appointed bounds, and where church and state conflict, that we must obey God's commandments. But there is no biblical teaching against health and safety measures, and indeed the Bible supports public health measures. The Old Testament had mandatory quarantining, masking, and other measures to suppress infection, which Jesus Christ himself endorsed, if you remember the story of him healing the ten lepers, why does Christ send them to the temple uh, to be examined? And of course, the answer is to be examined by the priests to prove that they no longer have this contagious disease. But in sending them there, he is endorsing the framework, the public health role that they are playing. So how do we do better at detecting and avoiding misleading conspiracy theories at a time when the very elect apparently can be deceived. The Bible provides a formula, I believe, for avoiding teachings and theories which are derived, quote, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes, which is really Greek translation for conspiracy theories. It's found in Ephesians 4.14. And what is that formula? Paul describes it as an engagement with the church community, the body of Christ, which working together helps equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, Ephesians 4, 12 to 13. It's interesting, as, as Protestants and Adventists, we view the, the gathering of religious knowledge as a deeply personal event. It's me, my Bible, and God. And of course, there's a place for that, for a place for personal conviction about spiritual matters, and that's important. That's what helps define Protestantism. But there's also a place for the community. And this passage in Hebrews 4 talks about growing up together in the knowledge and the fullness of Christ. And while we may begin our Christian walk with a personal conscience and a call from the Holy Spirit, it seems that Ephesians is teaching us that to complete that walk, to have a fullness of that walk, to come to the uh, perfection of the fullness of the body of Christ, this is a community enterprise. This equipping happens with the support and assistance of those designated to hold office and lead within the body, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers, and dare I say, the physicians and the parl leaders and the church administrators. And I think this is a list that is consistent with uh, the list that Paul sets out in Ephesians. And it's caused me to realize that the reason the very elect are not deceived is not because they are so smart, right? Why would Christ say, if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived? The smartest people can be deceived. And let's acknowledge right now, I'm not saying those that get the vaccine are smart and those that don't get the vaccine are not as smart. There are very smart people on both sides. The difference is that the elect know which community to be a part of that their expertise and their evaluation can be shared with an appropriate community, which help leads, helps lead everyone to the wise, careful, balanced, biblical decision and outlook. Um, of course, one must find a community that is committed to the authority of Scripture and open to the leading of the Holy Spirit within the body of believers. Uh, some people on the other side at times object if, if, if my formula was followed, Martin Luther would still be a Catholic today. Um, and I, I think the problem with that line of reasoning is that it suggests that whatever church we're a part of now has rejected the primary authority of Scripture and embraced the primary authority of the church over Scripture. And I don't think that the Adventist church or most of our evangelical colleagues um, have overtly have done that. We are committed to the authority of scripture. Um, and a question that might be asked is, what alternate community is the anti-vax conspiracy movement offering us? Is it 
uh, a truly spirit-guided, balanced, embracing alternate community? Or is it rather offering membership in a shared sense of grievance and even defiance against leadership, both civil and spiritual? How enduring, supporting, and stable are communities based almost entirely on opposition and defiance? The anti-vax movement often proposes actions that fits, I believe, the description provided by Ellen White of the posture we should not take in the face of governmental authority on a matter far more central to our prophetic outlook, that of Sunday laws. She said that we should not defy government mandates forbidding Sunday labor. She noted that, quote, to defy the Sunday laws will but strengthen in their persecution religious zealots who are seeking to enforce them. Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers. Keep right on with your missionary work, with your Bibles in your hands, and the enemy will see that he has worsted his own cause. One does not receive the mark of the beast because he shows he realizes the wisdom of keeping the peace by refraining from work that gives offense, doing at the same time a work of the highest importance, close quote. That's in Nine Testimonies 232. So these recent, the recent uh, vaccine uh, regulations from the government in the United States didn't actually require a vaccine. He said you could take the vaccine or you could mask and test on a regular basis. None of those things contradicts teachings of the Adventist church or any other Christian church I know of. So on what basis would Christian leaders say we must defy this mandate? Ellen White herself said that even when it, it, laws are passed uh, regarding uh, no labor on Sunday, that we should not defy those laws, even though we know that they're connected with future events that will become more repressive. And I know we have Sunday Keeping Friends uh, on this uh, broadcast with us, and it, I should hasten to add that we are not uh, in conflict with Christians who keep Sunday what we are in conflict with is Christians who keep Sunday and want to use the civil arm of government to make others keep Sunday, right? Those are two different things. And uh, we, uh, we are uh, very fine in having fellowship with the former group, with, uh, with Christians who keep Sunday out of a sense of conviction uh, and religious observance. We, we admire and respect that. It's when we attempt to force our beliefs on others through the civil arm of the law. And I think most, if not all of you online who are Sunday keepers would agree with us on that point. I pray that you would anyway. The recent, um, one can paraphrase Ellen White and say that one does not receive the mark of the beast or preparation for it because he realizes the wisdom of keeping the peace by testing and masking. Too many Adventists, even some leaders, have shown the need to better understand our own prophetic message and be more discerning regarding counterfeit and dangerous conspiracy theories about the government and church leadership. Indeed, Ellen White had very strong things to say about those who engaged in anti-government rhetoric, opposing and speaking against government leadership. She said this, some of our brethren have spoken and written things that are interpreted as expressing antagonism to government and law. It is a mistake thus to lay ourselves open to misunderstanding. It is not wise to find fault continually with what is done by the rulers of government. It is not our work to attack individuals or institutions. We should exercise great care lest we be understood as putting ourselves in opposition to the civil authorities. We should weed out from our writings and utterances every expression that taken by itself could be so rep misrepresented as to make it appear antagonistic to law and order. We are not required to defy authorities. There will come a time when, because of our advocacy of Bible truth, we will be treated as traitors. But let us not hasten that by unadvised movements that stir up animosity and strife. Six Testimonies 394. I think these are words of wisdom that can be appreciated by all, whether or not you believe in the inspiration of Ellen White or not. She's a Christian thinker and leader who is talking about the biblical framework and principles of approaching 
government leadership and authority. And so those who say that the government is out to kill its own citizens, either recklessly or even intentionally by depriving them of uh, valid treatments and imposing on them treatments that are dangerous and even deadly, uh, are painting the government as an enemy and calling essentially on people to defy the government. Church leaders who maintain silence and even tacit support for those that peddle in anti-government conspiracy theories reveal they have not grasped these admonitions, as well as the historical lessons provided by the disaster at Waco. They do not realize the ongoing baleful impact of anti-government conspiracy theories on the Adventist and the larger evangelical church. This ignorance, sadly, is being paid for in an increasing body count of sincere but misguided Adventists and other Christian members. Adventism and conservative evangelicalism will continue to be susceptible to movements that expose them to danger and even death unless it can come to terms with the weakness of some of its members and even leaders for dangerous anti-government conspiracy theories. We know that rulers are not to be obeyed who require the violation of God's law. I would hope that all Christians uh, could see and support that point. Uh, but, in short, but short of that, in words more Adventists worried about their conscience need to understand, the Bible tells us in Romans 13 that rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God. Now listen to this last passage very carefully. It talks about conscience. Usually we think of conscience in terms of opposing those in authority. But Paul uses it a little differently here. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. It's Romans 13, verse 5. So conscience at times can be used to oppose government overreach and violation of God's rules and, and, and moral order. But conscience can also at times counsel us to obey the government. Conscience is not just seen in opposition to authority, but also in respect for authority, especially when that authority is seeking to protect the community and save lives, even if we do not always agree with the means used. And I would be the last one to say that the governments of the world have perfectly carried out lockdown procedures and quarantining and, and all of these things. Have there been missteps? Have there been overreach? Have there been yes, yes, yes? But in almost all instances, these have been driven by legitimate health care concerns and the government leaders are doing the best they can to protect lives, to protect the economy and keep society moving forward. I want to conclude with a bit of a reflection here on Adventist identity, epistemology, and the importance of the community of believers. And I think it it applies, again, to the larger conservative evangelical world, um, as well as our Catholic brothers and sisters, though they generally have a stronger sense already of the importance of community. We perhaps have reacted so strongly against them that we've gone to the other extreme. And let us acknowledge that. The question of the true nature of Adventist identity will continue to be debated. There are those that will insist that our primary concern is that of conscience and religious freedom. Thus, all health mandates ought to be opposed and resisted. This is perhaps ironic for a church whose early leaders involved themselves in the movement to pass mandates outlawing the use and sale of alcohol. Others will argue that our true identity is in balancing the realms of conscience and health, recognizing that the health of others in the larger community is also a legitimate matter of conscience. And that, I think, would be my position and the position that I've set out in this paper. But perhaps the larger question is, how are we to resolve these conflicts of identity? What authority do we turn to? The Bible, of course, both sides will say, but then they will interpret it differently. Or the spirit of prophecy, some will say, 
and then interpret her differently. It perhaps does not seem very Protestant to say the community of believers, but that is because I think we have embraced an individualism that has more to do with modern secular conceptions of the autonomous self than it does with Martin Luther's priesthood of all believers. We take his important construct of the social believing community interacting and submitting to each other, and we replace it with something more akin to a gathering of popes, capital P, where each of us becomes an authority in his or her own right, not just on matters of theology and doctrine, but the limits and shape of conscience and religious freedom. And the truths of science in the middle of a pandemic, everyone becomes his or, own, his or her own papal expert and reliance on appropriate leaders, whether civil or ecclesiastical, is viewed as weakness and naivety, notwithstanding the Bible's admonition that we are to respect and submit to the powers that be within the church as well as the state. It perhaps takes us back to the notion of college that underlies the community of the university. Here we are at a university lectureship, hoping that we can achieve some kind of unified knowledge in the midst of complexity and diversity. But a university is only possible where there is an underlying collegiality of engagement and cooperation among the leaders and professors and students, the gathering of thoughtful inquirers where ideas are exchanged, expertise is recognized and appreciated, and where we submit one to another as the Spirit works through the system of oversight and consultation we have as a church. One of my biggest complaints against some of the prominent anti-vax voices in our church is that none of them that I know that are personal friends of mine consulted with me or other religious liberty leaders in the church that I can find, or with our significant health leaders in the church. They are not qualified in this field. Perhaps they have theology degrees, uh, medical degrees, uh, but they're taking prominent positions on matters of conscience and religious liberty and choosing not to consult with the church leaders uh, and experts in this area. And it's not that we feel we're in a position to tell them what to believe and give them permission to hold their views, but it's that not to undertake a collaborative discussion shows a breakdown in how the body of Christ is meant to deal with these issues. Many of us are disappointed at the disunity in the church on some of these important questions today, but perhaps we should be even more surprised and appreciative of the basic unity that we find in many of these questions on health um, and religious liberty. Among the health, religious liberty, biblical and administrative leaders of our church, there is a strong consensus approaching unanimity, not perfectly unanimous, but at the higher levels of our church, at our unions, at our division, at our general conference, on the um, usefulness and importance of the vaccines and the need to take caution during this worldwide pandemic. We might say that the center is holding, but the experience is also revealing a deep divide in the pews and a widespread misunderstanding as to how knowledge is reliably obtained, evaluated and applied to our lives and that of our community. We need to revisit important ideas that give balance to our Protestant Adventist individualism, like the priesthood of all believers in community, the role of the college and collegiality in arriving at truth, and the importance of engaging the body of Christ and its leaders in assessing truth claims, spiritual, historic, and scientific. It is not that we turn over our consciences to others in the community, but we recognize that the truths upon which conscience operates cannot be fully and exhaustively investigated by any single person, and the shared expertise in the body of Christ serves as an epistemological guide to knowing certain truths that we cannot fully know on our own. Perhaps this community is less vital where doctrinal biblical teachings are at stake, which we can study and know for ourselves, but even here, as we move beyond core biblical teachings into more secondary matters, the community becomes increasingly important. A good example is the question of ordination and gender. And questions of health, science, and history, 
which are not directly revealed in the Bible, become much more complex to assess, and we need the assistance that our dedicated and expert brothers and sisters can provide. The crisis of Adventist identity, of evangelical identity, is perhaps to realize there is something more than merely the identity of Adventist individuals, of evangelical individuals, that there is a larger identity, a body of Adventism, a body of evangelicalism in which we participate, that the body of Christ is more than the sum of its individual parts, and that the parts of this body mysteriously work together to form a community that is more profound, more wise than the sum of its individual parts. May we, as Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love and grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That is my prayer for us all. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for that delightful and astounding lectureship. Indeed, it was a very enlightening one. Our topic at the Herald Baptist Lectureship this year was a very pertinent one. Some key points I observed were the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Getting vaccinated would help one to not have a fearful impact if infected by the COVID-19 virus. The SDA Church promotes preventative health safety measures and is against all conspiracy theories and deceptions. Also, all in all, there are smart and unvaccinated and smart vaccinated persons. And it all boils down to the elect, depending upon the Holy Spirit leading which choice to make. Thank you to our viewers on YouTube Special shout out goes to Marissa Andrews and Nancy Hamlet in the chat. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm Floyd Bailey signing off. Tune in next week again, same time, same place for another inspiring and blessed chapel service. Have an amazing week, everyone.